Good morning, and thank you for being a part of the Virgie Christian Church online service. Appreciate you being here. We are going to start as normal with our communion time. So if you need to get your emblems uh, gathered up at home, uh, now's the time to do that. You know, a couple of months ago, uh, I started using my meditations uh, out of our uh, hymnal. Uh, you know, it just, it, I began to realize that our hymnals are full of songs that uh, have plenty of worship and praise to God our Father. And some of the songs that we sing even include messages about the communion time. And this one here today I chose is, is another one that most people are going to be real familiar with. You'll probably get it uh, shortly after I start reading this. But I want to inc include this today, and this will be our communion meditation. <clears throat> the song says, Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation, Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise him, praise him. Tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. The second verse of this song to me, it just clearly describes what we're doing, gathering around this time of communion around the table of remembrance right now. It clearly says it's for our sins. He, Jesus, suffered and bled and died. And because of that, he then, we can call him our rock, our hope of salvation. Jesus who bore our sorrows, his love for us was, has no boundaries. And it's wonderful. His love for us is deep and it's strong. Because of the fact that we have salvation through Christ's blood and hope for eternal salvation with him because of his rising again, we are to hail him, we are to praise him. We should sound his praises everywhere we go to everybody that we meet. We should tell of his excellent greatness and we should praise him ever in joyful song. Whether you sing to somebody about Jesus' impact on your life, or whether you just tell somebody about the impact of Jesus on your life. That's our mission. That's our goal. That's what we need to do as believers. People need to know the Lord. They need to have a personal relationship to him. And because of his uh, suffering on the cross and his dying for us, we have the opportunity uh, to be saved, eternity in heaven, and we're so thankful for that. Let's pray. Father and God, you knew right from the very start of time that, yeah, we would need a Savior. And so you sent your Son to this earth to take our place. He took the suffering and the sorrow and the shame. And we can only thank you because that's all we can do in a case like this. But we strive to live our lives according to your word. It's our job to spread the message of Jesus' work in our lives and in the world around us so that people can have an opportunity uh, to be saved. Father, you want none to perish without knowing him. So that's our job. Help us get better at that and help us to do better at that, Lord, in all times. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> the bread represents the body that was broken, beaten, and suffered for us. We take the bread in remembrance each week. Let's do that now. The juice represents the blood that was shed on the cross for the remission of all of our sins, present, past, and future. Drink you all of it.
Welcome, Virgin Christian Church, and everyone else watching from wherever you're at. I, I've heard rumors that there are people from all over the country watching, which is exciting to think that because of this, we have the ability to reach people in every aspect of the world uh, to preach the gospel from a little country church in uh, northern Indiana. So that is exciting to me. We want to say welcome to you and happy Father's Day to all the dads that are out there. We just hope you have a great day, dads. We appreciate you. We appreciate all that you do, um, all that you continue to do, the love and support that you show, the encouragement, and sometimes the discipline uh, that falls on the shoulders of dads. So we just want to th say thank you so much for all of that, and we pray that you have a great day today. Uh, sort of like Mom's Day, hey, kids uh, of all ages, uh, remember, let's just not take a day uh, in May and a day in June to respect and honor our fathers and mothers or grandparents, but let's love one another all the time. So with that in mind, we're going to, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about Father's Day today, but honestly, I wanted just to keep going. And I think this is something that affects us all, and that is we're going to keep working on the Sermon on the Mount today. We're just going to keep going. Um, we're going to look at the words of Jesus today because I think it truly affects us all. And it may even affect us a little bit on how we uh, deal with uh, Father's Day and Mother's Day and Grandparents' Day and, and all the other days out there. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew 5. We're going to be in the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to start at verse 21. I have to say that I, you know, I been trying to plan this whole going through uh, Sermon on the Mount series, and today is a day I was dreading. I'll be very honest with you. There are two things in this uh, short few verses that we're going to talk about that I struggle with. One, I struggle with, and that is the anger part, and uh, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. And the other one is, there's even a part about offering, and you know how much I don't necessarily like to talk about offering, but we're going to talk about that for just a few minutes when we get to it. So this was really a challenge for me today to just be real. Um, I will admit that the beginning of this week, um, boy, I, I became a tyrant, uh, and I've had to apologize uh, to my boys to some extent. Um, yeah, I, I, I struggle with anger, and I, I think many of us do. Uh, I hope it's not just me. Uh, I've admitted to you in the past the Taylor temper tantrums that my mom always used to say, um, but I really struggle with anger. So this has really made me uh, look deeper into why anger can be such a bad thing. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, and we are going to start in verse 21 and it says these are Jesus's words it says you have heard the ancients were told the Old Testament you shall not commit murder and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court and whoever says to his brother uh, you good for nothing now uh, the Greek word here is raka Raka actually means empty. So it, he's actually saying anyone who says you empty-headed, you good-for-nothing, you worthless person, stupid would be a good word, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court, and whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. So let's talk about these for just a minute. A.B. Bruce said this, there's a major difference between the words when he writes raka, which he, ex he ex expresses a contempt for a man's head. In other words, he's stupid. More expresses a contempt for his heart, a character, meaning you scoundrel. So when we look at these two words, uh, I, I think many times uh, we say them and we don't realize the implications of them. Um, and I know I, I get caught up in that. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think about the tearing down of these words. When we stop and look at these words, you know, a lot of times we, we go, ah, that was stupid. Well, the word may seem uh, very nonchalant or, or cavalier, but when we say that directed at someone, you're stupid. That affects us 
heavily. I want you to think about, I, I would say that probably 95% of us who are watching this or hearing this video have been called stupid, moron, idiot, uh, fool, uh, good for nothing, empty headed, chuckle headed, bone headed, knuckle headed in our life. Now, many times we say that and we're, it's in jest. Ah, you big knucklehead. I call myself a knucklehead often. But many times we've heard it with a degree of anger. And I think that's where we really need to, to deeply search ourselves. Because I believe Jesus is saying this. When we say something in anger, when we're angry, then it changes the meaning or the expression of the word. I, I know when we're joking, you know, at, at home a lot of times, ah, you chuckle head or... Oh, you fool. And it's meant as a jest, it's meant as a joke as we're playing, but when it's said in anger, it can cut to the very spirit of someone. It's almost a degrading thing. Uh, there are words that we would say that we would never say to one another, uh, especially in our ethnicity. Um, we, we know that it would be slanderous or mean. Jesus here, I think, is trying to point out to us when he says, that when he's referring this, that you shall not commit murder. First off, anger is usually the first step to someone who commits murder. Now, some Bibles will say, thou shalt not kill, but there is a difference between killing and murder. And you'd say, how? Well, we're not going to get into all of that today, but uh, someone who goes hunting will kill an animal. Jesus is not necessarily referring to that. He's saying when you murder someone with anger or hatred in your heart, that you'll be liable to the court. We see that time and time again. We have a very decreased love of life now. It's nonchalant. It's, it means nothing. Life used to be important to us. We see that life now is Nothing more than something that we could throw away. We see that in abortions. We see that in the murder rates that are all getting crazy or crazier. We have walked away from God in our ability to love. That's why he says, when you say these things, when you say it with anger and bitterness and contempt, we say it with a meaning behind it. I don't know about you. But I know as a, as a young man, uh, probably in my teens, I don't really remember, there would be times, and I'm apologizing, I've apologized to my parents for it in the past, I didn't mean it, but I said it. After getting grounded, or getting something taken away, or something, I would walk into my room and I know I'd go, oh, I hate them. Hatred is, leads to something. Hatred leads to our inability to love. Anger is the first step in leading to us losing our love for someone else. Now, do, does everybody get angry at times? Sure. I, I fully believe. I, I, I know a few people that I, I, I guess I could look at and go, I don't know that they have an angry bone in their body. But I would say that they are in the very small percentile. Uh, and I think most of us, is, if pushed hard enough, would say that we can lose our temper. We be, can, can become angry and bitter. Jesus says in verse 22, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother, now the question here is you could say, well, who's my brother? Well, that kind of goes back to the sermon on who's my neighbor. And if you call yourself a Christian, if you say that you are born into Christ's blood uh, through baptism, then your brother is everyone in church, everyone sitting next to you that calls themselves a Christian. It's not necessarily just your biological brother. I don't have a brother, so I guess that means I'm okay, right? I, it's okay to get angry. No, absolutely not. My brother is anyone that I run or in, in contact with. Because the problem is, is when I show my anger side, my frustrated side, my mean side, my belittling side, then I am not showing the love of Jesus to those that I am around. Whether it's my children, my wife, my family, or, or my friends, or those I don't even know. We all have those when the person cuts in front of you going 65 miles an hour down the interstate. 
that we get. You, I can't believe you just did that. You, you almost killed us both. Or, uh, you know, not too long ago, I, I just honestly shook my head. Uh, Grace was with me. We were going to do a daddy-daughter date. We went up to uh, Dairy Queen, and Dairy Queen at lunch is crazy. Uh, it was literally, if you've been to Dairy Queen in DeMont, you know, it kind of comes around from the back of the store to the front of the store, and it wrapped all the way down. It, I think we were probably in about the 15th or 16th vehicle trying to get up to the drive through And as I'm coming kind of uh, west from Tyson's to then make the curve to go back toward Tyson's, if you will, uh, there's two more cars sitting here, and this woman drives around the two cars sitting this way and literally cuts me off and goes in. And my first thought was, I cannot believe you have the gall to do that. But then I looked at Grace and we just laughed about it because there was nothing we could do. It wasn't like I was going to get out of the car and shake her. Uh, but it was just, but I think about that and think five years ago, would I have gotten out of my car and said, what are you doing? Do you not see all these cars here? See, it's how we respond to situations that may make us angry, may infuriate us, may make us not even understand what could be going through people's minds. But when we look at it and we go, what will this solve? Will me getting out of the car and ranting and raving and screaming like a lunatic next to her car solve anything? And it would not. Uh, I looked at the lady kind of off to the side who she, the other lady who literally cut around her, um, and I just looked at her, and she just had the biggest smile like, I can't believe that just happened. I think many times when we look at situations, if we were to just smile and go, okay, maybe they're picking up food for the fire department because there's a big fire going on, and she just needed to get in line. I don't know. But we have two ways to look at every situation. One is we can get angry. There's many things I think in life every day that we can get angry. Whether it's the behavior of someone, the inability to listen or follow, um, or just because we don't like them. And that is completely opposite of what Jesus calls us to do. Jesus here is changing it to say, the act of murder, he's relating that to anger and the anger that we feel inside. Because when we have anger inside, it shows hatred. And when we show hatred, we're not showing love. Jesus came to show us the meaning of love. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 37. We believe again that most of this was written by King David. And he says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. This is Psalm 37, verses 7 through 9. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently on him. Rest and wait. You know, it, I remember when I, I have the two older kids, and I remember when I first became a dad, what do they always say to do when you're angry? Count to 100. Count to 1,000. Start at 1,000 and count backwards. Because by the time you get to one, you're going to lose your place and you're going to laugh. Why is that? It's for us to stop and to wait patiently. Our first instinct, I think it's just instinct to get angry and to fly off the handle and to say things, excuse me, that we can't take back. It, they say that for every good thing you say about somebody can lift them up uh, a little, but every bad thing you say can take 10 to 15 good words to rebuild. So one word would take you 20 words, 15 to 20 words, let's say, to rebuild that one word. Generally speaking, we won't say that many good things for every bad word we say. So how about this? And I promise that this is something I've prayed hard about all week just so I could stand before you and say, I struggle with this. I fail at this. How about this week we all make a pact. We all agree that this week and for the rest of our lives, we'll stop and we'll wait on the Lord. We'll wait for His peace. We'll wait for His patience. 
will wait for His grace, knowing that God Himself could easily fly off the handle at us for the crazy and foolish things we've done. But instead, He sent His Son. That's not necessarily an angry God. That's a loving God that showed us and gave us a way back to Him. King David says, Rest and wait patiently for Him. But be, do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because the man who carries out wicked schemes cease from anger, forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only leads to evil doing. For evil doers will be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Isn't that really what getting angry is all about? getting back at that person. Well, you didn't listen to me. You didn't do what I wanted you to do. You didn't act like I wanted you to act. And yet, how many times have we ourselves not acted as somebody wanted us to act? I can tell you, I, I often don't act as I'm wanted to act because Christ tells me to act in a loving way. Christ tells me that no matter what, I should show the same grace that was shown to me. So how can I then, if I don't show grace, receive grace? And that's where Jesus goes back to those who say Raka or More will be held in judgment before the Supreme Court. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to James chapter 1. Another example of James now telling us uh, what to do. Verse 19, he says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger. Boy, how many times have you heard that verse, right? Boy, I've heard that verse. How many times have you actually put that verse into action in your life? For every one time you've heard it, did you just do it once? Or did you make a change of heart to live that life. I struggle with it. But verse 20 tells us why. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. If we say, I love Jesus, but I hate you because dot, 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 we are not showing the love of Jesus. Jesus, I can find nowhere in the scripture that Jesus looked at somebody and said, I hate you. Did Jesus show anger? Yeah, he overturned the tables when things were being done very wrong and very inappropriately in his father's house. We can be angry at the sin we see, but we have to be angry at our own sin first. But that doesn't mean that we're angry with somebody else. We could say, oh, the devil made us do it. And you're right, but sometimes we, most of the times, all the times, we have a choice to make the decision. How many times have we said, oh, I'm going to go hang out with this group of people or I'm just going to go to this place and it'll, it'll be fine. I can, I'm, I'm strong. I feel strong today. And yet then we, we fail and we become weak. When we are in anger and frustrated and, and just downright mean to one another, we have failed what Jesus said. Verse 21 in James 1, it says, therefore, therefore meaning what? We got to look back at what happened here. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. So if we say that the word of God that is implanted in our life, Jesus just said, don't say, don't do things out of anger, don't become angry with one another then why is that? It is the ability to save our souls so that we will not go before the Supreme Court. We will not go before complete judgment because if we have hatred in our life, we will be judged according to that hatred. Verse 22, But prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. How many times have you been asked to do something and you didn't do it? I will, I will say this, uh, my wife for the last three days has asked me, honey, what do you want for Father's Day for a meal? Now you may go, oh, this is 
this is a start. I don't care. I, she has given me options upon options, and I love her cooking. I don't care, but she's asked me a question. So by diluting what she said, I am there not paying attention. I'm not listening. So this morning I said, you know what, honey, this is what I think sounds good. Let's do chicken fajitas, and she does this, I don't know what, I don't even remember, some type of pico something. It's very good. I love it. And then she said, of course, well, what else do you want to go with it? Whatever you want, honey, I don't care. It's just, it's all going to be good, it's going to be wonderful, because you're making it, and that's, that's special. But she makes stuff all the time, so, but this one's just for me. This is my choice. But often, we will be asked to do something, and we don't. James here says, be a doer of the word. Jesus says, don't hate. Jesus says, don't become angry. And, and just like the, what do you want for lunch or dinner? And we go, ah, eh, whatever, we blow it off. Many times, I believe, we blow off the word of God. Well, that one doesn't apply to me. Because I like my anger. Oh, I, I've heard this many times. Oh, well, I did it out of righteous anger. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. I would say many of us cannot say we did things out of righteous anger because we acted out of in or unrighteousness. We said, this is the way I, and once you say I, we have taken it off of Jesus. When we look at what Jesus did, Jesus says, do not be angry, do not be full of hatred, do not use words that cannot be repaired to break people down. Jesus says to love one another. Verse 24, James continues to go on. He says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man is, will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit the orphans, the widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. When we yell, you stupid, you fool, you moron, you idiot, you whatever, we have shown that we are of the world and not of Jesus. Raise your hand if that just cuts you to the core, because I'm telling you, I, I'm struggling inside, because I know how many times I have said those words. I have prayed diligently this week, just as I'm studying this and studying this and studying this, going, man, I am the last person in the world that should stand in front of a church and preach on this. Because I am a sinner when it comes to this. I struggle with this. Guys, we got to do better. We got a world that is falling apart right now. The hatred is just so great. I, I can hate you because you're a Democrat. I can hate you because you're Republican. I can hate you because you're white. I can hate you because you're black or brown or green or purple. I can hate you because you got a spiky head. I can hate you because you're bald. I can hate you because you got big feet or little feet or brown shoes or white shoes or a green belt or a white belt. It's out of control. There is no part of this that Jesus said hate anyone for any reason. We have to stop the hate, the anger, the hatred. As Christians, when we show love, the world can change. But if we're not showing anything different than what the world does, as James just said, we are nothing more than of the world. We need to put our words into action. We could read this Bible all day long and until it places a heaviness on our heart 
to change our spirit and our soul, then it is doing nothing for us. We're wasting our time. You might as well pick up Harry Potter and read it because you may get more life-changing event out of that than out of the Bible if it's not affecting who you are. When you read the Bible, it should change. It should cut you to the core and make you change what you do in your life. Back to Matthew. So Jesus finishes this up. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, okay, so verse 23. Therefore, if you are presenting your, your offering at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, I, I want you to see the wording here. You remember that your brother has something against you. In other words, you have done something to offend or anger your brother. This is not you are angry with your brother. This is your brother is angry at you because of something you did. Now, sometimes that will happen and you may not know about it, and I, I get that, but if you know you have done something to hurt or anger your brother, then you are the one to take the first step. You are the one to go to them. Um, it says, leave your offering here before the altar and go. If you're sitting in church right now, if you're watching this video right now, pause it and call or go to the one that you have offended and, and apologize. This doesn't say, this is talking about being in church, right? We're going to the altar, we're giving our offering. Um, and it says, but go right now. Don't wait. This is not a, well, I'll get to it. I'm available uh, next week, Friday at 2. This says do it right now. Why? Because we don't know when we will go before the judgment seat of Christ. And that could be right now. Jesus says immediately, drop what you're doing. Go to them and apologize. Go to them and make amends with them. Then come back and give your offering. So now we're talking about offering. This is something that's important because offering is a type or an act of worship. When we give offering, yes, we may not give sacrificial offering uh, as in animals, but I think w giving offering is sacrificial in itself because what we give is what God has blessed us with and we are giving it back to him that it may go grow tenfold to, to continue his work. So not only are we seeing here not to be angry or hatred, we are showing that when we're giving, that we should be giving with a pure heart, not with hatred or anger, or having somebody else feel hatred or anger toward us. Leave your offering there. Go before, go before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponents at law while you are with them on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and that you be thrown in prison. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you've paid the last penny or the last cent. We need to make amends. Why? Because Jesus has made amends for us. We have been purified by the blood of Christ. If we have been purified by the blood of Christ, then we need to show that same purification, that same blood, that same grace, that same mercy. I don't care what big word you want to use here. We have been made by Jesus clean. So therefore, when we go before someone else out of anger or hatred, we need to go before them and try to make amends and, and ask for forgiveness. In my commentary by Stott, he says this, the pictures are different. One is taken from the church, the other is from a court of law. One concerns a brother, verse 23, and the other is an enemy, verse 25. But in both cases, the basic situation is the same. Everybody has a grievance against us, and the basic lesson is the same, the necessity of immediate, urgent action. And the very act of worship 
if we remember the grievance, we are to break off our worship, go and make it right. In the very act of going to the court on our way there to settle our, our debts to the, the, that person. Why? Because we need to have a pure heart when we, become, when we come before the throne room of God. Think about the Old Testament. Once a year, the high priest would go in to the Holy of Holies. He had to have a pure heart in order to bring uh, the sacrificial offerings for Israel. He had to come in and he had to present offering for himself and his family and then for all of the nation of Israel. He had to be pure as he walked into the room, into the very courtroom of God. We have that ability now when we kneel down and pray to go before the very courtroom of God because the veil was torn because of Jesus. We now have the ability to show that same grace that was shown to us in a way like never before. We need to be Jesus. We need to be grace. We need to get rid of the hatred and the anger and the frustration. It's going to happen. The world's going to throw things at us, and how we respond to that is how we will act, and we will either embrace it with a smile and say, Jesus loves me, or we will embrace it with hatred and say, I hope you die. Because anger leads to hatred. Hatred leads to injustice. Injustice leads to murder. Jesus says, don't allow any of that in your heart or in your life. 1 John 3, and I'm going to leave you with this. Verse 13, it says, Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. The world's going to hate us, but we don't hate the world back. Verse 14, We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. You cannot hate someone if you love them. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Hmm. James, the brother of Jesus, tying that all in pretty nicely. And you know that no one, no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid his life for us, that we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need closes his heart against him. But how does the love of God abide in him? I will leave you with that question now. If we hate the world, if we close our hearts to the world, if we close our hearts to the sinners and we look at them and say, they're different, they're not like me, you're right, they're not because they haven't received the blood of Jesus. If we close our hearts to them, then how can we say we are abiding in God's love? Can't. The two don't go together. Love and hate. Oil and water. And yet we're called to love everyone as Jesus loves. Dear Father, we praise you for these words. As hard as they are to hear, as hard as they are to accept, we are all fallen. But we have been made new by the blood of your Son. Father, change our hearts that we would stop the hatred for any reason. Any reason. And help us to love as Jesus loved. Help us to not look at someone because of what they're wearing or what they're driving or where they live or what they look like and judge them for that. But help us to love that person as you love them. Hoping that all would come to repentance. Father, don't make us the judge and jury. We are not worthy of that cause. But we are so worthy of loving one another because of the gracious love of Jesus. Father, this week, put it like a milestone around our neck to stop hatred, to stop anger, and to love as Jesus loved. 
and then remove that burden from us that we may never be angry again. When we love, we cannot hate. And the world will see us differently. They'll see you. And we praise you, Jesus, for that. Be with us this week. Guide us this week. Challenge us this week. And love us, Father. And we ask this all in Jesus' holy and blessed name. Amen. Guys, thanks for tuning in. Hope you have a great week. And hey, we'll see you next week.